Evet sanırım başlayabiliriz. Hepiniz hoş geldiniz. Ben Mehmet Polatel. Ranting Vakfı'nda çalışıyorum. Let us get started. My name is Mehmet. I work here at the foundation. Akit Ezcan couldn't make it because he has COVID. I'll be the moderator instead. And um, hopefully uh, they will join us tomorrow on Zoom, Zoom to deliver their presentation. I'm going to um, introduce our speakers in English. Zoom. And uh, our, uh, and also I'm going to uh, introduce all of them uh, once. And our first speaker is Evangelia Ahladi. Uh, she taught modern Greek at the Greek language and literature department of Ankara University in the period of 1994 and 2000. She also taught Turkish uh, at the University of Athens. Now uh, she has been library and culture coordinator of the Cultural Center of Greece in Istanbul since 2012. Her research interests lie in social and educational history of Ottoman Greek Orthodox communities, Karaman Yedika literature and Asia Minor dialects. The title of her presentation is The Greek State's Super Supervision of Orphanage, 19 1922. Our uh, second speaker is Alexandros Makris. He had bachelor's and master's degrees in political science and history department at the Pantheon University. He completed his PhD at the National and Kapodistrian University. He is now doing research on Greek veterans and war victims of interwar Greece. The title of his presentation is Transnational Welfare during the Armistice Period activities of Minister of Relief of Greece in occupied Istanbul. And our uh, last speaker is Constantina Andrianopoulou. Uh, she will join us uh, through on Zoom. And uh, she studied history and archaeology uh, at the National and Kapodistrian University. He, she has a master's degree at history uh, at the Boston University. And also a PhD degree at History and Political Science at Pantheon University. She's a researcher in Intermusic Research Program at the Laboratory of Ethnomusicology and Cultural Anthropology at National and Kapodistrian University. The title of the presentation is Contested Futures. And by the way, uh, the title of the presentation has been changed. Uh, now it is Contested Futures rescued Greek Orthodox children in Istanbul during the Allied occupation era. So each speaker has uh, 20 minutes after they complete their presentation. We will Q&A session. I'd like to thank the Haranting Foundation and everyone at the foundation for bringing us together and also compliment them uh, for this wonderful uh, work that they carry out. History of the Greek Central Foundation of Relief. So, a series of extraordinary military measures during the World War uh, I years caused different refugee population movements. The article that you can see in the slide, published in the Greek newspaper in the States, National Herald, Ethnikos Kyrix, in February 1919, reminds us of the extraordinary conditions that prevailed after the war, the war's deplorable legacy. So after the end of the war, refugee groups migrated or were transferred from the provinces to Istanbul, for many the nearest, safest center they could reach. The Constantinople Pathfinder, a, a survey published by the Americans in 1922, estimates the number of refugees in Istanbul at 100,000, 
and attribute this congestion to the fact that foreign and local relief organizations were better organized in Istanbul than elsewhere. There was an unofficial task division among the many foreign and local relief commissions active in the city. The Ottoman Red Crescent were focusing on Turkish refugees and immigrants, while the American Red Cross was mostly active with the Russian refugees. In the case of the Greek Orthodox uh, refugees, it was the Greek state, the Patriarchate, and local Greek community institutions which undertook the relief work with the contribution of foreign missions, such as the Near East Relief. The Near East Relief, an American organization initially founded for Armenians during the war, but later included Syrians, Persians, and Greeks, and uh, after the war focus, focusing on women and children. So during the occupation years, next to the three allied powers, the Greek state had its representative in Istanbul, the Greek High Commission, and was also represented on a few commissions for the administration of the city. The Patriarchate, immediately after the end of the war, had founded the Patriarchal Central Committee for the Displaced Greek Populations, which undertook the mission of repatriating the Greeks who had been deported before and during the war years. Alexandros Makris will talk about this. Greece, having received different waves of refugees the previous years, had founded many assistance societies, such as the Patriotic Foundation in Athens, and even a Ministry of Relief in 1917. The Patriotic Foundation sent four missions to Asia Minor to assess the situation with refugees, especially orphans. This is the stamp of the uh, Greek Central Foundation for Relief. Realizing the scope of the refugee issue and that gathering and raising orphans was a long-run endeavor, the Greek state founded in spring 1919 the Central Foundation for Relief, Kedriko Nidrima Perithalpsios, which undertook the policy of establishing new orphanages as well as supervising the existing community orphanages in Istanbul and the provinces. The Central Foundation was a component of the Greek High Commission in Istanbul. The Board of Directors was elected by the Greek High Commission, but made up of local Greeks. Although a state agency enjoyed a certain independence that allowed it to benefit from private initiatives by the well-organized community charitable institution, uh, institutions of Istanbul Greeks, as well as contributions by foreign commissions. So, before the war, the Greek community operated two central orphanages in Istanbul. One was the National Orphanage for Boys in Prigipos, Biukada, Princess Island, which housed close to 150 residents. The impressive five-story and 206-room building was initially designed as the Prigipo Palace Hotel, but in 1903, after it was bought by the Patriarchate, it was converted into an orphanage. The second orphanage was the National Orphanage for Girls in Proti, Knaliada, housed uh, close to seven, uh, 70 residents. Next to the orphanages in Istanbul, large orphanages operating, uh, operated also in Asia Minor, in Flaviana, uh, Zinjidere, which housed about 200 uh, orphans. So, during the first World War years, many community institutions were confiscated in Istanbul, orphanages with their substantial equipment being among them. The Kuleli military school settled in the building of the Biukada orphanage. The orphans were transferred to the Greek School of Commerce in Halki and then to the orphanage of four girls in Proti, Knaliada. The orphans returned to Biukada in October 1919 after a wandering that lasted four years, while in the meanwhile, the building housed German soldiers and later Russian refugees. So the Greek Central Foundation for Relief took over the supervision of the orphanages already operating in Istanbul and established new orphanages which housed mainly 
the war orphans arrived from the Ottoman provinces. So the orphanages that were founded by the Central Relief after the war was, uh, apart from Prikipos and Halki, the, uh, the National Home for Girls, Ethniki Stehi Halkis, established in Halki in April 1919, and from April to October 1919, housed also the Boys of Buk uh, Bukada Orphanage, which opened later in October 1919. Also, the shelter for the homeless of Pera, Beyoglu, Asylon Astegon Peran, shelter in Besiktas, Asylon Diplokionio, and the uh, Pendic Orphanage, founded in December 1919, uh, for orphans with average age from 5 to 7. And also, a hospital for orphans suffering from trachoma, trachoma, an eye condition very widespread at the times. Parallel to the orphanages, there were, of course, shelter houses in many parishes, many community initiatives on parish level by the philanthropic societies uh, of the local Greeks, soup kitchens for the orphans living outside these institutions, but also for the adult uh, war refugees. In June 1920, the British commissioner drew the Greek commissioner's attention to the case of a building in Kabatash occupied by Ottoman Greek orphans and the need for the Greek relief to find other premises for them. And also there were rescue houses for young women and children who had been abducted or stayed with Muslim families. In these neutral houses were gathered orphans to determine their ethnic identity before transferring them to an appropriate Armenian, Greek, or Turkish orphanage, a complex subject that Kostadin Adrianopoulou is going to present us. So every orphanage has its own criteria to accept children. According to the statute of the Biukada orphanage, the children recruited could not be younger than six years old or older than 12, a regulation from which refugee children were exempt. The residents were examined for infectious diseases and vaccinated. In order to be accepted into an established orphanage, the orphan needed uh, a note, a ticket, with all personal information available. And sometimes even recommendations about the, the origin from which institution or from which parish shelter was coming. Uh, you can see in the slide uh, uh, some pages of the Biukada uh, orphanage uh, registers. So the orphanage registers record the uh, orphan's name, age, place of birth, orphan category, fatherless, motherless or full orphan, and place of residence of next of kin. And of course some general observations uh, namely persons or institutions, they brought the orphan to the institution, if it was transferred from another orphanage, from the provinces, etc. Apart from the names, <coughs> sorry, apart from the names which are important for family history, the information saved in these registers, especially the age and place of birth of war orphans, is very telling for the history of the ruined Greek Orthodox communities. Uh, we can see in this slide that is from the shelter for homeless orphans in Beyoglu, that this uh, categorization in, uh, on the left, orphana patros, fatherless orphans, or telios orphana, full orphans, and of course, the very important patris, that is the place of birth and origin. Regarding the place of birth, the Pontus, Karadenis region, Vithynia and Thrace stand out. To give only to give only one example, in Pendik Orphanage, which housed close to 200 children aged 5 to 7, 53 children came from one community, Nihori of Chile, a community totally destroyed in 1921. It doesn't come as a surprise that the majority of the war orphans were fatherless, while the number of motherless or full orphans was very low. 
Although in principle the central relief gathered only full orphans, accepted many children whose mothers could not provide for them. A policy the Greek Central uh, Foundation tried to implement in order to ensure self-support and professional rehabilitation of the orphans was to provide elementary education, technical training, by setting up vocational schools and workshops to train carpenters, blacksmiths or shoemakers. A polytechnic institution was designed while the establishment of a rural centre in Triglie was one of the projects that was started thanks to the donation of an Ottoman Greek from Triglie. Now, apart from Istanbul, the Greek relief established refugee orphanages in the provinces, mostly in Thrace and Pontus, Karadenis region. Many orphanages in Pontus, in areas under the Kemalist control, were either dissolved later or came under the direction of the American Near East Relief. In April 1920, the Greek High Commissioner estimated that a total number of 20,000 Greek orphans were scattered in the provinces, adding that, I quote, orphans collected in a wild situation and today live under relatively good conditions provide an indication of the vitality and organization of Hellenism in Turkey, end of quote. The Greek High Commissioner reported that 17 orphanages founded by the Central Relief housed more than 3,000 orphans, including a total of 1,372 orphans only in Istanbul. <coughs> These Istanbul uh, statistics numbers uh, are very close to the statistics given uh, by the Constantinople Pathfinder, the American survey, which recorded 1,548 Greek orphans housed in the main four orphanages, as you can see here. The American survey points out to the beautiful and healthful locations of the Greek orphanages, but also to the many deficiencies, the inadequate infrastructure, uh, the, especially for the hospital of uh, the, um, uh, the, the orphanage for Prigipos, the lack of water, Prigipos was the biggest of the orphanages, uh, inadequate number of teachers, uh, as well as the absence of physical and recreational work. For American standards, very important at that time. And here are some notes for the Halki, the second biggest orphanage for girls. And this is the, the observation about the, uh, the absence of supervised recreational and physical work is an observation that is repeated by Americans and shows the different uh, standards, of course. Apart from very interesting observations like that the, the people in this part of the world, they don't know to play, how to play. So the, the American uh, survey, yes, I think I should skip this. Let's come to the economic maintenance of this uh, foundation, uh, which was secured mainly by the Greek state subsidy. 3 million drachmas per year, according to uh, Elianos uh, official report, by local Greeks assistance, as well as American aid, which also depended to a great degree on local Greeks or Greeks of America. In July 1922, the Central Relief Foundation called the attention of the Greek High Commissioner to the financial problems they faced because of the irregular and insufficient subsidy from the Greek government. Furthermore, the support of the Americans, representing only 20%, had also been decreasing due to the crisis affecting the local Greeks. Here we can see some uh, detailed information in the Near East Relief Archives about the uh, Greek relief. It's a very, very registered, very, very detailed information about the, the places and uh, the, the amounts of the money. So the foundation called the Greek government 
to evaluate the importance of these orphanages from a humanistic but also from a national point of view. And I quote, it's up to the Greek government to judge whether these orphanages constitute a real necessity or whether they should be closed, abandoning on the streets our refugee orphans whom others would perhaps be happy to collect under other flags and religions as orphaned Christian children, but not as Greek children. Because of the financial situation in July 1922, the Greek government was planning to transfer the orphans of Istanbul to Smyrna under the Greek administration, a project that didn't happen, of course. After the Smyrna disaster and the retreat of the Greek army, Istanbul was inundated with tens of thousands of destitute Greek and Armenian refugees. In November 1922, the Greek High Commissioner reported to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that although there was no apparent danger of massacres since the negotiations in Lausanne were ongoing, threats had been made by the Turks to retake the orphanage of Prigipos and Halki. The Near East Relief also estimated that security commanded to transfer the Armenian and Greek orphans from Asia Minor to Greece. The Patriarchate agreed but believed that a number should remain so that the buildings would not be completely evacuated, providing the Turks with an excuse for their requisition. American foreign missions proposed their settlement to Mount Athos to the monasteries to rural centers, otherwise they would be obliged to transfer them to South America. The American Relief Commissions finally transferred more than 10,000 Greek and Armenian orphans from Pontus and the 1,800 orphans from Istanbul to Greece and settled them in orphanages all over the country, mostly in Athens and Piraeus, followed by Corinthos and the islands of Syra and Corfu. We can see here very quickly some images from the settlement of the Greek and Armenian orphans in Greece. Here you see a, a photograph commemorating the a cooperation of Greek and American relief commissions. American ambassador Henry Morkendau with Armenian and Greek orphans in Greece. Greek orphans in Athens and some images from Armenian orphanages in Oropos. Uh, it's maybe out of the scope of this talk, but it's an information that I wanted to, to share here. Armenian intellectuals from Istanbul were settled in Corfu in order to teach to the Armenian orphans their language and culture. So, until 1927, some of the Armenian orphans were transferred from Greece to other countries, as we know, such as France or Soviet Armenia, while 500 were sent to Egypt thanks to the British Lord Mayor's Fund. In conclusion, a great number of war refugees, mostly women and children, among whom many orphans, took refuge in Istanbul after the occupation. However, the influx of refugees continued as many Greek Orthodox communities were deported after the end of the war, Chile, Nicomedia, Ismit, Nikia, Isnik, among others. And other communities, especially in Pontus region, were fleeing as the Turkish troops were taking over their provinces and, of course, the refugee movements in the aftermath of the Smyrna disaster. The numbers and place of birth or origin of the war orphans tell us the history of the ruined Greek Orthodox communities from another perspective. The Greek state, out of need, but also as part of its national policy, emerged as the main coordinator and primary financial supporter for the relief policy and work for the Greek Orthodox refugees after the war through the Greek Central Foundation for Relief. However, the local Greeks, the Istanbul Greeks, provided material and moral support to the Central Relief, community buildings, personnel, volunteers, and an incredible network of charity and hometown societies. While foreign missions, such as the Near East Reliefs, supported refugees, orphans and women with a small but consistent and long-lasting contribution. More substantial was their contribution in the provinces and during the transfer of Greek and Armenian orphans to Greece. 
as a last uh, uh, comment, rescuing the orphans and saving their national identity served a double purpose. While it fulfilled urgent humanitarian needs in, in times of deep crisis, it also lent support to the national claims of the Greek state. Thank you very much. Sorry for the. Thank you, Eva. Uh, Gunaiden. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude towards the organizers of this conference uh, for the acceptance uh, uh, to be here today, uh, for the whole organization, and of course for the kind uh, hospitality. Uh, the end of. Okay. Uh, the end of the First World War in the Near East, with the armistice of Mudros, found Ottoman Greeks uh, of Eastern Thrace and the Sea of Marmara region in an adverse situation. Almost 200,000 of them had, be, had been displaced uh, to Greece or within the Ottoman Empire. These populations wanted, first of all, their repatriation. Then, the relief for them and their families was necessary in order to rebuild their lives. The Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople uh, developed initiatives uh, for that problem. Uh, this paper presents the involvement of Greek state to this process. It is based on the archives of the Greek Ministry of Relief and of Foreign Affairs, the political office of the uh, Greek Prime Minister, uh, and the personal archive of Eleftherios Venizelos, publications of the Ministry of Relief and the Patriarchate, as well as the official uh, newspaper of the Patriarchate, Ecclesiastici Alithia. Already from the last days of the war, in October 1918, uh, the Patriarchate requested uh, the Sultan, I quote, to order the return of the priest with their flock from the provinces, end of quote. Uh, because of his negative uh, response in the aftermath of the armistice, the Patriarchate established a committee for refugees issues. It's okay. Okay. Uh, under the presidency of the Locum Tenes of Ecumenical Thre Throne, uh, Dorotheos, uh, Metropolitan of Prusa. In November 1918, this committee renamed to Central Patriarchal Committee uh, for the Displaced Greeks. Uh, its aims were the relief for ref the refugees, their repatriation, and the restitution of the properties which had been confiscated by the Ottoman, states, uh, Ottoman state during the war. In order to achieve these goals, uh, the committee developed uh, local subcommittees as well as uh, subcommittees with specific purposes, like the one for the writing a volume with evidences about persecution against the Greek Orthodox of the Empire, entitled Persecution of the Greeks in uh, Turkey, 1914-1918. The members of the committee belonged to the Greek uh, elite of Istanbul, and its president was Joachim Metropolitan Metropolitanofenos. From its beginning, the most uh, significant problem was the funding. For that reason, the committee requested uh, to Ottoman Interior Ministry a financial support. However, the ministry refused it. Consequently, the committee uh, requested the assistance from, uh, of the Greek government uh, in the, on uh, December 1918. In early 1919, uh, there was no progress regarding this request. On the contrary, there was development uh, as regards the institution of Ottoman Greeks confiscated properties. The committee collaborated for that issue with the British High Commission in Istanbul, and with this way, the first phase of refugees returning to their pre-war houses uh, was achieved. Uh, the Greek state finally decided to assist uh, the committee in the spring of 1919. In April, Alexandros Palis, who was sent to Istanbul so as to study the issue, in his memorandum to the government, stressed uh, that the repatriated refugees should immediately be helped with supplies, agrarian tools and animals in order to earn their livelihoods 
since 80% out of them were peasants. He pointed out that the credit of 20 million drachmas should be given to the committee since uh, today's reliefs cannot efficiently help these people. He finally argued that, uh, as I quote, uh, the solution of economic problems should be first be solved and uh, then the procedure of repatriation should take place. A few days later, Prime Minister Venizelos informed a uh, Greek High Commissioner in Istanbul, uh, Eftimos Kanelopoulos, that, I quote, uh, we are willing to help uh, the displaced Greeks and we will do any necessary sacrifices for them, end of quote. He also requested him to prepare the budget of this project. Kanelopoulos responded that it was necessary that the Greek state to contribute to the committee with 20 million drachmas. Result of the information developments was the degree of law, the great law of the Greek government uh, of May the 31st of 1919, with which a credit of 20 million drachmas, which is um, uh, 2.7 Turkish liras of that area, was created for the repatriation of displaced Greeks. Soon became clear that it would be more efficient to leave this project in one institution, and eventually the Minister of Relief was assigned as responsible for that. The Ministry of Relief was established in 1916, uh, firstly as Supreme Directorate uh, of Relief for the families of the mobilized men and refugees. Then, in June uh, 1917, it was upgraded to Ministry. The wider context of its creation was the upgrade of public health and welfare sectors during the Great War. Ministries' responsibilities were the care for refugees and war victims, the payment of allowances for the families of mobilized men, and after 1918, the repatriation of refugees. The project of repatriation was vital and, according to some historians, was one of the main reasons for the implementation of the Asia Minor Campaign. The demand for repatriation of the approximately 400,000 refugees uh, was uh, ubiquitous in Greek society and played a crucial role to the Greek military presence in Anatolia. Simultaneously, the repatriation was considered as a means of improving the economic power of Greek authorities in Asia Minor and Thrash. As Venizelos himself mentioned in a telegram to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in May 1919, I quote, uh, the cost of repatriation is not only a moral obligation, but it also has economic interest since the return to normalcy will increase the revenues of the Anatolian Greece, end of quote. In June 1919, uh, the Ministry created a mission in order to study the issues of care, repatriation and resettlement of Greek populations of Anatolia, Eastern Thrace, Southern Russia, Caucasus and Pontus. Head of this transborder mission was Nikos Kazadzakis, director of the Ministry and one of the most uh, well-known Greek novelists. Uh, the mission was consisting of high-ranking civil uh, servants. The significance of the mission was pointed out by a letter of uh, Spiridon Simos, Minister of Relief, uh, to Kazadzakis on July the 3rd, uh, when he, where he wrote uh, that uh, as the head of this mission, you, you will have unlimited freedom for your activities and you have uh, direct communication with Greek High Commission and Prime Minister Venizelos. This mission arrived in Istanbul on July the 7th and soon became clear that it would uh, be functioned in collaboration with the already existing Patriarchal Committee. The mission would be, as we can read in an official report of the Ministry, uh, just a supervisor as a civil service for the money which derived from the state budget. However, from the beginning, members of the mission expressed a reservation for the constitution of the committee, which, I quote, does not protect the responsibility of the Ministry because from the Greek civil servants, the General Director is just an executor of the decision of the Patriarchal Committee, and the General Inspector has the right of veto, but in a sense, he does not use it. Complaints of missions members for this uncommon situation continued since, in a sense, a non-governmental organization based outside Greece administrated funds from Greeks, Greece's uh, state budget without any control. So the Greek government was before the dilemma to intervene actively for the reorganization of the Patriarchal Committee in order to acquire full power and responsibilities of the committee uh, or to withdraw from Istanbul. Eventually, in August uh, 29th, uh, Greek civil service uh, officers were recalled, except Alexandros Palis, who remained in the High Commission, which had typically only the general control of the committee. I will mention just briefly that the mission continued its activities in the regions of Pontus and Caucasus uh, and South Russia, where the repatriation was finally considered as impossible. In a telegram of Minister Simos to High Commissioner in uh, September 26, he stressed that uh, the funds from the state budget was given, I quote, as a subsidy from Greek government to the Patriarchal Committee 
and that there is no responsibility of the committee about the way it uses these funds. Regarding now the function of the committee, from its, its beginning, it was it considered that the most efficient way for resettlement was granting loans to refugees. With that system, it is believed that peasants would be thrifty and careful and in, in the use of money, and that at least a part of these loans could be repaid. Apart from loans, the committee distributed peasants uh, the necessary agrarian tools in order to cultivate their lands. And also an additional work of the committee was the building of new houses for the repatriated refugees, as well as the repair, the repair of uh, others with similar damages. The revenues of the committee derived mainly by the sp sponsorship of Greek government and secondary from fundraising and uh, other sources. At the same time, the expenses were mainly loans and then care about, uh, about the care, repatriation, housing and other administrative expenses. You can see more details in these uh, tables. Uh, well, the most significant challenge for the committee uh, was undoubtedly the public safety, especially in rural areas. For instance, during a tour in July 1919, uh, committee members could not visit uh, under the fear of attack the region of uh, Kesani, Kesan, and Sarada Ecclesias, Kirkareli, I'm not sure about the pronunciation. Uh, and uh, as, a local, uh, as the local subcommittee uh, wrote in his memorandum, in its memorandum, I quote, uh, the situation of public safety is very unsatisfactory. Every day homicide, homicides robber and robberies against local Greeks were committed. Simultaneously, every day committed outlaw actions from Turk soldiers and policemen. Not to mention that the committee, the subcommittee, warned that uh, giving laws in this region is a risk because borrowers were considered as potential victims of a robbery. Finally, the Patriarchal Committee terminated its function in January 1921. In its final account, ended up in seven conclusions. First, uh, the loans and the house building cover an immediate need uh, for repatriate refugees. Second, the loans were generally effective. Third, peasants use the agrarian tools which uh, the committee uh, distribute for a crop. Fourth, uh, loans uh, were a valuable and necessary guarantee for peace and restoration. Uh, six, uh, fifth, uh, the repatriation cancelled the aim of Turks who wanted the extermination of the Greek element in the Turkification terfic terfic of these regions. Six, the commercial activities returned to Greek hands. And seventh, the Greek state, after the annexation of Eastern Thrace with the Treaty of uh, Serbs, 1920, uh, I quote, received reconstructed and solid Greek population. And from now on, the Greek authorities can complete and enhance the work which have already been done by the committee. As a result, of the, as a result its work can be understood as a success if you have in mind means and the funds of the committee. That I should have in mind that the repatriation was considered as the main solution to the refugee problem. Under this scope, the repatriation in the regions which were under patriarchal committee's uh, jurisdiction and uh, the presence of Greek authorities in Eastern Thrace uh, led to the solution, temporarily, finally, of this problem in these areas. In the wider context of the welfare in armistice in Istanbul, I will just mention that there were also supplementary the missions of uh, Red Cross and the Patriotic Relief, uh, Relief Foundation, institution uh, under the auspices of the Ministry of Relief. They organize hospitals and orphanages, and especially for the orphanages who have two uh, papers in this panel, so I, would, I will not uh, tell anything more. Uh, the activities of the Greek uh, state via the mission of uh, the Ministry of Relief in welfare politics of Ottoman Greeks uh, is a typical example of uh, Roger Brubaker's triadic nexus. According to him, in his book Nationalism uh, Reframed, this nexus involves three distinct and mutually antagonistic nationalisms. The first is the nationalizing nationalism of a newly independent or newly reconfigured uh, state. The core nation is understood as a legitimate owner of the state, and despite having its own state, however, the core nation is considered as uh, being in a weak uh, cultural, economic, or demographic position within the state. The second uh, is the nationalism of external national homelands. Homeland uh, nationalism monitor the condition, promote welfare, support the activities and protect interests of their ethno-national kin in other states. The presence of this nationalism uh, becomes more intense when the ethno-national kin is threatened by the dominant ethnic group. Between these two mutually antagonistic nationalisms, there are the national minorities, which cultivate their own uh, nationalism. 
this nationalism is closer to one or another uh, nationalism depending the circumstances. In our case, uh, Greece has uh, okay. In our case, Greece uh, as an external national homeland intervenes in the domestic uh, welfare politics of another sovereign state, Ottoman Empire, which under the leadership of young Turks th uh, threatened uh, Greece's ethno-national kin, namely here in our case, Greek Orthodox of Istanbul, Sea of Marmara and Eastern Thrace. They, uh, specifically their uh, elite under the leadership of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, approached, the, approached uh, firstly the Ottoman government since it believed that it was the most efficient solution for their welfare. However, Sultan's negative stance, in combination with the explosive refugee issue, led them to approach the Greek government. With this way, the relationship between Greek state and Ottoman Greeks is strengthened. As uh, Thrasivulus Petmezas, head of the mission of the Patriotic Relief Foundation, pointed out in a memorandum in May 1919, I quote, this mission will create an additional national bond of Greek state with parts of outside the state Hellenism, end of quote. This involvement was not only, of course, moral. In 1919, when Ottoman Empire was in decline and Greece in its zenith, was a suitable time for the Kingdom of, of Greece to support Ottoman Greeks. Welfare needs, which were appeared because of the First World War, provided a fertile ground uh, for Greek involvement, both materially and administratively. It was an unprecedented and uncommon situation, if we have in mind that Greek civil servants worked in a sense in a foreign sovereign state and coordinate the welfare provisions for the ethnic fellows there. This multidimensional mobilization of Greek state becomes clear if you have in mind that at the same time and at the same region was active uh, three Greek institutions, Ministry of Relief, Patriotic Relief Foundation and Greek Red Cross. In a wider context, these activities are part of the change of notion in welfare which occurred, in, occurred because of the Great War, when relief for social categories like disabled, widows, orphans or refugees is considered as an obligation of the state and not just philanthropy. In Greek case, key institution for this process was undoubtedly the Ministry of Relief. This notion of obligation to this population is clearly merged in an report, an unpublished report, of the Ministry for its activities, written in 1920. Uh, uh, I quote, uh, the endangered Greeks outside the Greek state were not uh, forgotten by the Ministry of Relief. The Ministry established services, distributed uh, funds, food staff, clothing, uh, medicines, cared for their housing and health, supported them against their neighboring hostile races. They organized and raised their faith in the nation. His work was really painful, full of danger. However, the ministry intervened in this environment because the needs, uh, these needs could not be weighed. End of quote. To sum up, uh, the fluid situation in Near East in the aftermath of the Great War urged Greece to develop uh, this policy, which I think we can name it as transnational welfare, uh, so as to help uh, its ethnonational kin and simultaneously to achieve its political diplomatic aims in the region. With that way, the, this external national homeland became, uh, via welfare, an additional factor in the complicated uh, situation in the armistice Istanbul. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alex, for your presentation. Now our final uh, panelist, Konstantin Adrianopoulou, uh, will join us to resume. Yes. Yeah, the floor Hello, is yours, Constantina. Uh, it's a pity that I'm not there, but I had to stay in Athens. So greetings from Athens. And uh, many thanks to the conference committee that gave me the opportunity. Constantina, wait a minute. Constantina, wait a minute. You, you don't listen, you don't hear me. Yeah, we are not able to hear you. Uh, do you hear me now? Better. Yeah, it's better. Okay, um, I will uh, shout. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, sharing my screen. I don't know if you can see it. Yes, yes, we are. Okay. 
So uh, the, the actual title, as you said, is Contested Futures, uh, Futures Rescued Greek Orthodox Children in Istanbul During the Allied Occupation Era. Um, after the two uh, uh, previous presentations, which were really interesting, I think we have the, the framework of the era from the Greek perspective. But let me start with a quotation and I will explain wh where this is from. So as you can see, 20, I start the quotation, 27th of August 1921, Polixeni Tiligiloglu of Dimitris, has his, her father's name, aged 15 to 16 years old from Sarapli of Gavis. Her parents named Dimitrios and Zoe were massacred by the Turks. She was found in Kalambision in Kadikioi on the 27th of August at the house of Refat Bay, where she dwelt three years ago. As she claims, she came here eight years ago with her aunt looking for a job. Her aunt placed her at various Turkish homes, then at Zeki Bay's and on his recommendation at Refat Bay, I received her and handed her over temporarily to the asylum of beggars at Besiktas until her admission to the national home. On the 28th of August, she escaped from the asylum and no one knows where she is. End of quotation. What I just read actually is a typical memo of 24 cases of young girls mainly and boys found in Turkish houses in Istanbul during the Greek Orthodox community's investigation for Greek children during armistice time. They constitute a 25 page handwritten booklet entitled notes on the Christian children discovered at Turkish houses and institutions, and it covers the period from May 1921 to July 1922. The booklet was kept at the Greek Orthodox Communal Archives. The editor remains unknown, but his notes includes many references to priest networks, so it could most likely have been a religious member of the Pera or Savrodromi Greek Orthodox community. I think I know that such intake interviews were common practice in the rescue and neutral houses founded by the League of Nations in Istanbul to house, and not only, to house orphan Christian children found in the streets or in Turkish houses and institutions in the post-armistice era. It was a basic means in the process of reclaiming mainly the Armenian children. Now I'm showing you um, official uh, uh, registers of the Allied Police, actually Allied Police documents about missing children. These uh, interviews uh, was a basic means in the process of reclaiming mainly the Armenian children back to the blossom of their ethno-religious community, but apparently the Greek Orthodox Ottomans also adopted the practice of conducting such interviews. However, the aforementioned booklet is the only known archival material we have as proof. Generally, the issue of child victims of First World War has not been adequately studied by Greek historiography, even though the persecutions of Greek Orthodox in the Ottoman Empire during the war have been well researched. And silent also are the stories of Greek Orthodox children placed in Turkish houses and institutions. So in my paper, I will present some of my research's results on this topic. And specifically, I will shed light on the policies followed by the Greek authorities during the Allied occupation of Istanbul, focusing on the role attributed to refugee children during the war. Enquired in this context is the extent to which discourse on children articulated by the Greek Ottoman elite from the mid-19th century differs from the one produced during and after the war. Uh, secondly, I will, I will critically discuss the methods adopted by communal authorities for rescuing refugee children. And this issue will bring us to a crucial, albeit extremely difficult question to answer. How did these children respond to rescue or reclaiming policies? And how can we come up, methodologically speaking, with a satisfactory response to this question? Did young Christian girls and boys who found themselves begging in the streets or in Turkish households had any agency in their troubled life. Uh, as already mentioned, these interviews 
with which I started, were conducted in the time span from the summer of 1921 to the summer of 1922. According to the head of the League of Nations Commission of Enquiry for Deported Women and Children in Istanbul, Dr. Kennedy, this was a period during which, I quote, there has been a marked falling off in the number of Islamized women and children reclaimed from Muslim houses and institutions in Constantinople. The Armenian and Greek patriarchates, in view of the fact that the British authorities appeared to disinterest themselves in such matters, hesitated to make applications to them, except in very urgent cases, and only 60 rescues have been effected since the beginning of the year 1922, although the patriarchates have knowledge of hundreds of cases." End of quotation. In the Greek case, it was not only the patriarchate and the Greek Ottoman bourgeois elite of the Ottoman state that, that took action in favor of the orphan and refugee children. It was largely the Greek state itself, as uh, Alexandros Macris actually mentioned. It is well known that during the First World War was uh, the heyday of Greek nationalism, as expressed by the irredentist ideology of the Megali idea, idea and the concomitant policies. So the Greek Orthodox population of the Ottoman Empire was crucial to the official national narrative and the Greek state's foreign policy. Protecting Greek Ottoman civilians' lives was a way to defend their national expansionary claims based on the Wilsonian language of the numerical majority's rights and supremacy. Thus, in 1919, the newly established Greek Ministry of Relief founded its branch in Istanbul, the Central Relief Foundation, under the auspices of the Greek High Commission at the city. Parallel, parallel to its administrative and coordinating character, as uh, Evagelia Kladi mentioned, the Central Foundation hosted war orphan children and it founded national homes in Halki, in Prigipo, in Pendik, and in Pera. In collaboration with the Patriarchate and the secular commun communal authorities, a network of all host institutions was set up and Evagelia talked about it a lot. Both the Greek state and the community perceived and presented war refugee and orphan children as national property at danger. Under the influence of liberal national ideology of the time, personal dramas and hardships acquired national dimensions. Destitute children, fondlings and orphans, as well as women from lower social strata, were the social groups par excellence around which the Greek Ottoman elite articulated its modern philanthropic slash humanitarian discourse and practices from mid 19th century onwards. Children and women were considered as the weakest yet most important groups for the biological reproduction of the community, its distinct ethno-religious identity and a set of bourgeois values. So their protection was synonymous to the protection of the communal boundaries and the community's reinforcement. Yet under the influence of national ideology during the First World War, community was replaced by nation. Thus, orphan Greek Orthodox children were represented as the nation's orphans, as you can see um, in uh, this advertisement from a newspaper of the time and their hardships were described as national martyrdom. Telling is the announcement for the inauguration of a new orphanage in Pendik, in Istanbul, during the summer of 1920, um, during which call, uh, orphans are called young nation martyrs. During the inauguration festivities, orphaned young boys and girls were reported to perform traditional Greek dances in front of the Greek High Commissioner, Mr. Kanelopoulos, celebrating the glory of the family slash nation. This light motif of children's martyrdom was also quite common in Western Europe, where operations for children compared them to the infants massacred by Herod. So religious connotations were a welcome addition to the otherwise secular humanitarian calls for help. 
Two religion went hand in hand with national ideas, thus young Greek Orthodox girls and boys, war victims, uh, are seen as a metaphor of the suffering nation. A good example of this, I think, is the report of the Greek High Commission's representative who visits Greek homes for boys and girls in Prigipo and Halki Islands, respectively, and he notes, I quote, the children victims of persecutions should receive proper spiritual education so that they won't carry the traumas of persecutions throughout their life, but also so that the nation won't suffer from the burden of useless and harmful elements. To the contrary, I believe that this is a great opportunity to take advantage of this material in order to gather and structure necessary members and shape useful units for the Greek Orthodox genus. I think that such statements showcase the demographic concerns behind the Greek state's humanitarian intervention. The First World War created thousands of orphan children in need. We all know that. The fact that called for immediate national and international humanitarian action, just to show the numbers of the orphans in 1920 21, whereas, for instance, in 1904, the communal orphanages in Istanbul hosted around 150 orphans, just to have a comparison. Wartime mistreatment of Ottoman Christians seemed to confirm the 19th century European orientalistic stereotype of Turks as barbarous Muslims of inferior race. So it does reinforce the plea to the civilized Christian West for humanitarian intervention. Information about lost or abducted Greek Orthodox children and the intense mobilization of the Armenians who dominated such searches was one of the reasons behind the decision of the Greek Ottoman authorities and the Greek state to take action. Additionally, I argue that the mobilization for Greek Orthodox children in Turkish houses can also be read in the context of the Greek state's demographic concerns, as I already mentioned. Here I just have a not very successful Google map showing the places from where orphans came to Istanbul and were uh, hosted. Uh, and I will just list a few examples. The religious and secular authorities of Bandirma region and Chile collected Greek Orthodox children who had been abducted by Turkish families while begging in the streets. The Greek military forces in Smyrna discovered Greek Orthodox and Armenian children in Turkish houses in Bursa and handed them over to the religious authorities of uh, the region. Also individual initiatives by Greeks of Istanbul were, ta were taken randomly during the Allied occupation of the city. For instance, a resident of Besiktas, Somarika, aged six to or seven years old from Nefsihir, playing with other children in the streets. And he, I quote from these notes that I referred in the beginning, he recognized her as a Christian while playing, took her and transferred her to the Patriarchate. But what does this recognition while playing mean? The person who conducted the interview notes that the girl was Turkish speaking only, so language factor does not seem to be one of the signifiers of nationality here. So what is recognition based on? Is it a religious sign or even an appearance remark that supposedly revealed her identity? In another case, a Greek Orthodox resident of Tatavla, Kutulush, saw nine-year-old Fodora walking and weeping in the streets. When asked why she was crying, the girl answered that Meleat Hanum, for, we, for whom she was working as a servant, wanted to make her a spouse Islam. After that, the young man took the girl and turned her into the patriarchate. So such stories raise the issue of the methods and criteria used for identifying and reclaiming Greek Orthodox children. Ethno-religious identifications was a tough one, mainly because it entailed a kind of an interrogation process that in many cases brought back memories of a harsh past, the killing or the death of their parents, the abandonment. So this rather traumatic experience reveals a violent side of children rescuing. Going back to the interviews with alleged Greek Orthodox children, with which I opened my talk, 
These differ in terms of the rhetoric they sur that surrounds them. In these cases, the process of rehabilitation sounds like a crusade to save the Christian identity of the children rather than the children themselves. With few comments on the status and the hardships they most probably have faced, the interviewer insists on the religion changing issue. The language used gives the stories a martyrdom-like dimension. In many cases, children are presented to be cursed by, for the Yavur, but strongly and bravely resisting their Turkish master's intentions to make them Muslims. They try to avoid it. They burst into tears. They run away. They are also presented going to the church so that they would not forget their fear. Religion is overstressed due probably to the clerical identity of the interviewer, but also in the absence of language as a national attribute. The majority of these 24 Greek Orthodox children discovered in Turkish houses and institutions in, in Istanbul were exclusively Turkish speaking. Apparently, this was due to the long-lasting absence from a Grecophone environment, and it is also well-known reality for many Orthodox in the Ottoman Empire, and a major contradiction in the Greek national discourse. But be that as it may, the fact that these children, most of whom were in uh, early adolescence, were to be placed in Greek-speaking settings, either in orphanages or with Greek Orthodox families that adopted them, made them face another language change. In addition to these cases, there were cases that did not exactly fit in the strict ethno-religious categorization. I mean, Greek Orthodox. Such was the case of children of mixed marriages. For instance, Marika from Van had an Armenian mother and a Greek Orthodox father. And even though in the Ottoman Empire, patrilinear and patrilocal tradition was in effect legally speaking, such cases were practically questioning the imperial ethno-religious and gendered civil system. And the same problem of these horizontal measures and categorizations of massive scale would arise a few years later with exchange of population. The favorable political juncture of 1919-1922 for the Greeks of Istanbul, combined with the aforementioned religious reflex and the eagerness for demographic relying offered the Greek Orthodox authorities the impetus to also rescue persons who did not have the profile of kidnapped children. For example, a 20-year-old Christian woman who had fallen in love with a Muslim, a Muslim man while working in a factory in Zeytin Burnu and lived together with him and had a baby or another woman, 22, not a ch child anymore, who worked as salary servant in a Turkish house in Tagelki. All these cases of Christian women and girls um, who were not exactly war victims, but at the juncture of the city's allied occupation, they were detached from their Muslim environment, showing the Greek Orthodox um, eagerness to not allow such cases and enforce demographically the community. But I think that it's very difficult to draw the line between these positive and negative aspects of the so-called humanitarian intervention. Nevertheless, its positive effects should not be taken for granted. Critics of the dispatching of Christian children from Muslim houses talk about cases in which children do not want to leave their homes for many reasons. For instance, 21 years old Katina from Gavis was living in the house of officer Shukru Bey and his wife, they had no children and they were, I'm quoting, uh, according to the notes this Greek uh, priest took, they were taking really good care of her and that is why she was detached with great difficulty. Or uh, after that, Katina was placed as a servant in the house of a Greek Orthodox family. Another case, 12 years old Ephthymia who lived from the age of seven at the house of a trapper, uh, Megenji Bozu Ali Bey, who treated her as his daughter, called her Bebeka and then Melek, and never cursed her for being Yavur, and so on and so forth. So contrary to the mainstream dominant humanitarian discourse that overwhelmingly present children as defenseless and hopeless children, 
uh, subjects, children need to be viewed as capable of social action, even under adverse circumstances, such as war. Some of the girls, especially the older ones, found and taken by Greek authorities, managed to escape from the orphanages, either for good or just for some days. They were perhaps searching for a better environment and status. For instance, the Armenian authorities handed over to the Greek representatives a 16-year-old Anastasia from Adana, who refused to stay with them. When she returned to the neutral house, the Armenians placed her at the Greek orphanage in Halki. Anastasia demanded to go back to Istanbul. However, four days later, she returned to Halki, eventually staying at the orphanage. Or 13 years old Fotini from Aydin was found in uh, the Turkish orphanage at Kayit Hane, where she was badly treated and bullied. Yet after her admission at the Greek house in Halki, she escaped and gave herself in to the Turkish police of the island, insisting that she was a Muslim. Thus, she was able to leave for Istanbul. Those and other similar stories bring out, I think, individual choices and strategies that question the rescue policies, offering examples of the children's agency. This is, of course, not to say that pro-children action was not needed, still, it presented contradiction as most large-scale measures in, ta in times of emergency do. To sum up, Greek Orthodox children victims of the war preoccupied the Greek Ottoman authorities and the Greek state. Both presented children as collective symbols of the war, of national martyrdom, mobilizing national forces and structures, as well as communal networks for their support. Children Rescue was seen as a humanitarian act, but also as a demographic necessity for national numeric enforcement. In particular, the individual cases of Greek Ottoman children found in Turkish houses and institutions, mostly in Istanbul during Allied occupation, shed light to an unknown Greek historiographic topic. They bring to the fore the importance attributed to these children, the contradictions in methods of rescue and categorization of rehabilitating persons, and at the same time, they underline children's own agency. Indeed, through these memos and surveys, children emerge as social actors or carriers of agency. Despite their scarce numbers, fragmentations and overlaps, such stories, I think, intersect with important political events, offering a historiographic glimpse of undereducated, albeit crucial aspects of this past. Thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you, Constantina. Thank you, Constantina. I believe we had about 10 minutes for Q&A. Can you hear me right now? Yes, I do. Oh, okay. Great. Okay, uh, now we have time for uh, questions. Uh, please state your name and uh, the name of the speakers to whom your question will be addressed. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Ozan Ceyhan. I would like to ask Evangelia. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I have a question in my mind that you mentioned uh, the the orphans, uh, the childrens uh, are taken to uh, Soviet Armenia and France and Egypt. I can understand the European Armenia, but why Egypt? Because of the ancient relations with Greece and Egypt, or uh, why Egypt? about the the Armenian the last comments maybe I was not very clear the last comments it was about the Armenian orphans only in Greece so I don't have uh, it's not I haven't done research on that uh, just I wanted to give some uh, information that I found it uh, interesting I mean the I know that there is research on the subject 
probably there is somebody here that is more uh, <laughs> can answer this uh, question. I think Mary Herol, I think, knows better <laughs> that I can see from here. <laughs> Uh, but we know that uh, uh, Greece, this is maybe not very known, Greece was the third destination for Armenian population in general, if I'm not wrong. I, I'm wrong. <laughs> we have. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, the, the, the majority of this population, not only the, the orphans, also the, the refugees, the adult uh, refugees, they were transferred in the decay in the th uh, 30s until 1920s, uh, 30s, they, they were transferred to, to other countries. I think that we have more specialists here that can uh, <laughs> add to that. My name is Tunja Erdoman. I would like to thank you very much for this. My name is Tunjar Duman. Thank you very much. I have a few brief questions. My question is addressed to Evangelia Ahladi, but others, uh, other panelists may also respond. Photographs of orphanages in the island, they are still here. But what about Ayas Pasha, Pera, and others? What is the state of these orphanages? Are these orphanages still stand, still remain today? There are perhaps still remnants. That's my first question. And second question is, of course, there are certain areas in Istanbul, like Tuzla, Arnavutke, where we have a, a great number of uh, Greek Orthodox community members living. What was the main decision for selection of these sites or locations? Was it a decision by the uh, Greek Orthodox community? What is the reason for these orphanages concentrating in the islands? Is there any special reason for that? A third question daily life in orphanages. Do we have any documents, any information uh, as to the daily life of orphanages? For instance, are orphanages used also as administrative buildings? Are orphanages, do or, did, did orphanages also function as schools? Or would children staying at the orphanages be taken to school separately? And what about the aid? For instance, clothing aid. Do we have any documents on that? Thank you. I cannot give you a, an accurate response, but in terms of site location, before the war, the orphanage on uh, Princess Island was opened in, in 1913 uh, because of the uh, significant Greek Orthodox population. And also, of course, the island offered a very good site. And indeed, uh, this uh, orphanage on uh, Prinkipo Island was not foreseen as an orphanage. It was constructed to function as a hotel, but only after it was taken over uh, by the Ecumen Ecumenical Patriarchate, it functioned as uh, a, an orphanage. And do we still have remnants of these buildings? Uh, I don't know. I don't have any research on that because I have recently started working on this. I don't have photographs. I don't have documents. But of course, there are uh, many witness accounts. There are some uh, uh, Greek Orthodox uh, who uh, used to work as teachers or principals at these schools or orphanages and uh, they shared very good account about their experience of the orphanage in Prinkipo Island. They also give us very good insights about daily life in these orphanages. 
I believe I've also covered this in my intervention, but yes, there are some schools inside orphanages and indeed uh, the uh, orphanage complex on Principo Island included a separate school section and many orphanages also had uh, workshops. Uh, what, what was the other question? Interpreters need microphone. Yes, this was the case prior to the war. For instance, the Ottoman government offered uh, meal assistance to the uh, Greek orphanage in Prinkupo Island, but this was the case before the war. At least this is what I read. I don't have any other information available. Well, of course, after the war, it was mostly the foreign uh, commissioners, particularly uh, uh, the American commissioners, uh, who provided that type of assistance. I hope I could respond to your question. Are, are there any other questions from our audience? Şale Mildanoğlu. Uh, we all uh, ask questions to uh, Evangelia Ahladi. I want to ask questions about the ch children who were sent to uh, Greece, who were transferred to Greece. What happened to them? Uh, their whereabouts, I'm uh, curious, uh, were they also sent to orphanages in Greece or were they placed into families? And when it comes to Armenian children, uh, did they establish any separate or special mechanisms were they transferred to families where armenian kids uh, were handed to uh, patriarchate yes there, there used to be very big orphanages in greece as i also showed in the photographs but for how long these orphanages operated and when they uh, closed down exactly uh, this i can't tell when we look into the bibliography, we can see that starting from the 1930s, we see more and more uh, of Armenian schools. And I think we can uh, use Armenian schools to, to make an opinion on that. And perhaps you can help me on that because you know this subject better than myself. Hello. Concerning Armenian children and orphanages, Armenian children were transferred to. There were certain centers in Greece, Corinth, Corfu, Syros, Oropos. There were certain orphanages in those islands. And of course, the number of Armenian children uh, was quite significant, uh, almost half uh, the population of Greek children, talking about 7,000, 8,000 Armenian children. I believe that these orphanages uh, were shut down uh, even before 1930. They were closed down around 1929 because by that time, these children at the orphanages, they uh, grew older. Some of them got married, some of them started to work. So I believe uh, by 1929, these orphanages were closed down. Uh, we can uh, still uh, take one more question, one last question. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to ask a question, but I would like to clarify a point about Armenian orphanages in particular. I'm not talking only about post-1914. I believe that we should talk about the history of Armenian orphanages. Uh, I mean, if you are looking for a nation uh, which is quite wealthy of orphanages, then one needs to uh, look into the Armenian nation. So the problems did not really start in 1914, even earlier. For instance, if we consider 1869, uh, you, one uh, 
cutting off the massacres in many provinces in Anatolia and as a result of these massacres uh, there were many orphanages established for Armenian children and this is not only limited to Istanbul we have Amasya, Sinop, many orphanages in those provinces around Anatolia and after 1915 there was an influx uh, into Istanbul and as a result new orphanages uh, were established there was a committee established by the patriarchate this is a very long story indeed thousands of Armenian children from Anatolia uh, were uh, placed into various Armenian uh, schools and there was one uh, special orphanage for girls and one for boys but at the end of the day there were so many orphan uh, children that uh, those uh, children had to be placed into uh, multiple Armenian schools in Istanbul. One would never think about it, but for instance in Izmir there was a very important orphanage and it was long before 1914. So we should actually uh, trace back further if we are talking about Armenian nation and orphanages. Thank you very much for this contribution. Uh, with that, I would like to uh, close this session. I would like to take, thank our panel and our audience.